going from day to day. So glad to see you in the Lord's house. Do you have any announcements you might share with us? Well, just be mindful our nominating committee is going out and asking folks to serve in different ministries. And so if you're approached, uh, please know that we've already been praying. And uh, we pray that you've been praying as well. And we need to have these ministries ready to go by September. Some of them are already in progress. And again, we have just a couple more that will be starting back in September, the children's worship ministry for children's church and then uh, the nursery for worship as well. So we're we'll working on that. So we look forward to a wonderful time getting back full blast in September. Any other announcements? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Go ahead, ma'am. Speaking of that, the children's church, I need three helpers and a teacher. Um, and if I had to talk to you, and we worked last year, um, I would appreciate if you would let me know if you're still interested. Also, um, I've got a sign-up sheet in the back with that to you. Okay, so uh, for the new folks may not be aware, we have four teams for the children's church. Each team takes a Sunday out of the month. And we, normally there's three different people every week. Miss Jamie is heading it up and she'll coordinate. We normally have two or three alternates in case somebody can't make it a certain week. She'll ask an alternate to fill in. And so if you're able and willing, please see Miss Jamie or sign up on that sheet that's in the vestibule. Appreciate that. Yes, ma'am. Please don't forget the care ministry. Uh, if it wasn't for crystal feeding the box, we wouldn't have it. So I really appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you. But um, also, if it is your right to serve and you cannot <coughs> serve, would you please let me know so that I can make arrangements for somebody else to do cards for that box? But we really need the box to be fed. And if you give a prayer request here in church, there's a or is the alternate for any ministry that where there's children involved, if you're not already receiving an email from me about the, the background check for anyone involved in the children's ministry, uh, be sure you give me your email tonight if you're here. Instead of sending it just mass distribution to everybody involved in the ministry, I prefer to just send it to the people that oversee particular ministries and their alternates, and that'll be a better span of control for us doing the background. Okay, any others? In the way of prayer requests, I have a cousin that has passed away, and uh, her memorial service will be on Friday. Uh, please remember Sue Ellen, if you will. Any others? Well, remember the family and what I mean to say. Yes, ma'am. Do you remember I have a cousin who's just been diagnosed with stomach cancer and that's going to be soon? Amen. Rest up. Not yes. A not a prayer request, but just want to share God's blessing. I've been on standby for jury duty all week this week and met the most wonderful lady there today. And we talked and we talked and we talked. Went out to lunch together, fine Christian woman. She's been through so much and is just still just blessing God with Amen. every breath. And I just thank God that he can put those people in our paths Amen. no matter where we are. That's a blessing. Yes, sir. Well, keep a neighbor in mind, uh, Jerry Patterson, he's going through some trouble, troubles, and uh, keep him in prayer. And also, uh, Tommy goes back tomorrow, Tommy Patterson goes back tomorrow to see the doctor. So let's pray that, that, that when they take the patch off, that the things will be quite right closer. So. Amen. <laughs> Talk to Miss Cecilia today, and she is going to be staying where she is in Little River for another week. Uh, that will keep her until next Thursday. And that was her desire to stay as long as they possibly would let her to be able to heal up before she comes home. So keep her in prayer. She's looking forward to getting vacation Bible school started. <laughs> Any others? How about by the uplifted hand? Lord knows our desires. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful, Lord, for this opportunity to come to your house tonight. We worship you in spirit and in truth, and we thank you, Lord, for each and every blessing you bestow our way. Tonight you heard the many requests and many more, Lord, that was not mentioned. 
Uh, but you know the hearts and desires. You know the needs of each and every person. Pray that you would intervene and move in every situation, every person's life. And Father, be a blessing in their life. And we pray that each and every one of us will be a blessing to you as well in the lives that we live. As we continue on in our service tonight with our children singing and, and then our Bible studies, we pray that your blessings will be upon the teachers and all the students in the different classrooms for the youth and the children, as well as here in the sanctuary with the adults and listening in through Facebook for all of us. We glorify you and we thank you for everything you've done and everything you'll continue to do and what you're going to do for us tonight. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we're ready to hear some singing.
Well, it's a joy to be back in the Lord's house. And as we open up his word, once again, we're going to turn to Revelation chapter 9, verses 13 through 21. Tonight, as we discuss the sixth trumpet, the sixth trumpet. Revelation 9, 13 through 21. Our Heavenly Father, as we now once again turn to your word, I pray that you will lead us and guide us in all spiritual truth, that you be honored in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So look at verse 13. We'll just take it a verse at a time or two or three at a time, but look in chapter 9, verse 13. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. If you remember in our last study, the demon locusts come up out of the bottomless pit and were on the earth for five months, tormenting men, not to kill them, but to torment them and cause great agonizing pain. That was the fifth trumpet. Now we're into the sixth trumpet, and it's going to change. It's going to go from torment to actual killing uh, those who still refuse to accept Christ. And so when the trumpet sounds, a voice is heard uh, to speak uh, from between the horns of the golden altar. And that voice is believed to be none other than Jesus Christ, who is given the command to <laughs> loose the four angels. The mention of the four horns of the golden altar previously had been mentioned in chapter 8, verses 3 through 5. Listen to what it says. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer, and there was given to him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And so normally when you think about the altar, the golden altar in heaven or an altar here on the earth, we think of it as a place of prayer, a place of worship, a place of intercession. As we go to God in prayer and we're interceding on the behalf of others, or Jesus himself is taking our prayers to God. And so we normally think of this when we think about an altar and here the golden altar a place of mercy where prayers can be offered to the Lord. But in these verses, we're going to find out that instead of a place of mercy, the golden altar becomes a place of judgment, a place where God is about to pour out his wrath upon this earth. And so when people reject the grace and the love and the mercy of God, there's nothing left but his wrath and his judgment. And so that's what we're going to see in these uh, remaining verses in this chapter. The world has rejected the grace of God, and so there's nothing left to give them but his wrath. If you will, look at verse 14. It says, Say unto the sixth angel which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And so that voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, said these words, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And so the sixth angel is given a commandment to loose the four angels that are bound. That is significant. They're not free angels. They're angels that are bound imprisoned, if you will. We do not know why these angels were chained or imprisoned. We don't know for how long a period they've been chained or imprisoned. But we know that they are to be set loose on the world and to give out destruction, death, and all that follows. Scripture never speaks of holy angels being bound. But scripture does speak of evil angels being bound. I'm reminded of Jude uh, verse 6 and then 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 4 where it speaks about the angels that are reserved in chains of darkness until the day of wrath or the day of judgment. 
And so while scripture never speaks of holy angels being bound, it does speak of evil angels being bound. And so it stands to reason because these angels are bound, they must be of an evil nature. Now the mention of four angels bound reminds us of some other fours we've already come across. Uh, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. In Revelation 7, 1, 2, the four angels holding back the winds from blowing upon the earth, God's wrath, until the saints of God were sealed, until that 144,000 were sealed, they were to hold back the wrath of God, symbolizing holding back the winds upon the earth. And so these spiritual beings are given authority by God at an appointed time, and we'll get to that in the next verse, to go out and start meeting destruction upon all those who have still rejected his son. They are described as being restrained because they were bound, and he says, let loose the four angels. And so they're being restrained until some appointed time and then are released. Now, it mentions the great river Euphrates. This river is one of the most prominent rivers mentioned in all the Bible. We were introduced to this river way back in the book of Genesis in the creation of the Garden of Eden. It was one of the four rivers that had prominence back during that time. And so when you think about the area where the Garden of Eden was and the great river Euphrates uh, flowed in and through it, or rather it flew uh, through, flowed from without it, we think about the first sin was committed in this area. What was that sin? Adam rebelling against God's word, disobeying God's word. The first murder was committed in this area. What was that? When Cain slew Abel. We think beyond that, the, the first of uh, the flood, it began here in this area. The Tower of Babel, where men rebelled against God, it was in this area. Now, speaking of the Tower of Babel, men had a mind to build a tower to reach heaven. They had a good thought to reach heaven, but the motive was wrong. If it had just stopped, they wanted to reach heaven. I thought that would be great. But you know what the motive was? So we could make a name for ourselves. It wasn't to reach heaven to honor God and worship him. It was all about making a name for themselves. And God had to come down and confound their speech. And that's when the different languages began on this earth, where they couldn't communicate. And so they left off the building of the Tower of Babel. We think about the Israelites that were captured into Babylonian captivity were from this area. And then this is the where the final surge of sin on earth is going to take place during the great tribulation time. There is only so much evil angels can do. We realize that they are hindered from being totally let loose unless God is in control of what's going on. Think about Satan for a moment. He's not got the power to just go out and do anything he wants. He's limited. All we have to do is turn to the book of Job to see that for a fact. <clears throat> when God showed Job, uh, showed Satan rather, Job, his servant, that hated evil and did good, and Satan said, well, no wonder he serves you. Everything he touches turns to gold. He's got a nice family, got riches beyond anybody could compare to. But you let something happen to all those things. He's got all those <clears throat> possessions, all that family. He'll turn against you. And God said, that sounds like a challenge to me. You go do anything you want to him, but don't you put your hand on Job. You see, he was limited. And so he went out and uh, through the course of time, some of his animals were stolen. Some was burned up in fires. And even his family uh, was killed in a whirlwind that came and knocked the house down when they were all get together in the home. But Job wasn't touched. Why? Because the devil was limited. Well, there come a time when Satan came back before God and God said, how about my man Job? You moved me against him, but he still held fast his integrity. And Satan said, well, you got me that time. He's tougher than I thought he was. But you let something happen to his own flesh. 
All that a man has will he give for his own health. And God said, that sounds like a challenge. Well, you go ahead and touch him any way you want, but don't you take his life. Don't you know that Satan is limited? He can only do what God permits him to. And so he did. He went out and he afflicted him with sore bowls from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head. And he was in agonizing pain. But still, Job held fast his integrity. Even Miss Job said, curse God and die. But Job said, no, we're not going to do it. Shall we receive good at the Lord and not evil as well? And all this Job did not sin is what the Bible says. But the purpose was to show God that mankind would turn on him. But Job didn't. So he's a prime example that no matter what you face today, if your faith is strong in the Lord, you can make it through. Hallelujah. And Satan is limited. No matter what he throws on you, you remember, God knows all about it and God's permitting it for a reason. We don't know the reason. I'm sure Job didn't know the reason. It was a contest between Satan and God. Job, he was innocent in everything. He didn't know why he was being afflicted, but he stayed strong. He stayed stuck on Jesus is what I like to put it. He stayed stuck on God. You and I in our day and time, when Satan's going to afflict us, how much will it take for us to turn on God? But if we'll stay focused on God, we can endure. And that's what we need to do. We need to endure Satan is still on a leash. He is in some measure restrained from doing anything that he can do to you. He can only do what God permits him to. And I don't know about you, but that's a comfort to me. That when the Satan comes on me, I realize, hey, God knows all about it. And if God's permitted, there must be a reason. I need to try to learn from this reason and just stay stuck on Jesus. Look at verse 15. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. The very hour is marked out. Think about that. God has marked the very hour for all this to take place. Now, Matthew 24, verse 36 says this. But of that day and hour, no, no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. God knows what he's doing. And God's got the day, the hour, the week, the month, the year. He's got everything worked out in his plans. Amen? Now, the words were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year tell us that God indeed does have a plan. As we read this book, we may think that everything's going in chaos. What is God doing? But it's all in his plan. He has given ample opportunity for people to come and receive him. But there's coming a day when, Je when God's going to say to Jesus, son, go get my children. I've been long suffering year after year, but now it's time. And as it was in the days of Jesus, in the fullness of time, God set forth his son. Well, in the days of the rapture and the great tribulation, in the fullness of time, when God says enough is enough, he's going to start to plan in action for the future events. Now, when it speaks about this preparing for an hour and a day and a month and a year, this pinpoints a specific time. It's not random. It's not, well... Yeah, I think I'll go ahead and do it. No, God's got a plan. Just like you have probably a calendar with different dates pinned down with your doctor appointments or family gatherings or, or whatnot, there's a specific date and time God's going to set everything in motion for the future. Until that specific moment, it cannot happen unless God deems it to happen because it's all in his plan. And you know, God has a plan for you as well. Don't you realize that? Amen. Now, you're not going to see this verse up on the board, but let me read it to you. I'm going to read it to you in the King James, and then I'm going to read it to you in an NIV because it's such a wonderful verse. But I want you to listen to it. It's Jeremiah 29, verse 11. This is what it says. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Now listen to the NIV version. 
For I know the plans I have for you, declared the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Amen. God's got plans for us. And I don't know about you, but that excites me that God's got a plan for me. Does that mean I understand God's plan? No. You see, way back in my young adult years, I never had no thought God would call me to be a preacher. That was the furthest thing from my mind. Now, I've always been very active in the church. I've been working uh, for many years on committees, youth director, uh, in the choirs, directing children's choir, and all kinds of, all through the years, even become a deacon. But then God called me to be a preacher. That was the furthest thing from my mind. You know, the very first time somebody said to me, I think the Lord's calling you to preach, was my preacher. He looked at me one day and said, Roy, I think God's calling you to preach. I said, I don't think so. There ain't no way. I mean, when we sang in the group, Susie did all the talking. I couldn't even talk. Susie did all the talking for all of us men. But as time went on, more people began to say the same thing on the job site. Are you a preacher? I said, no, I ain't no preacher. Put that thought out of your mind. Just because I would read my Bible during my lunch hour, people think, you must be a preacher. No, can a Christian read his Bible? But then the Holy Spirit started dealing with me. And I began to realize, that, well, maybe he is calling me to preach. I don't know. How do you know? Because I've never gone through that before. So how do you know? And so I would read his word and just try to ask God to let something leap out to know that he's called me to preach. And I'll never forget December 26, 1991. During my lunch hour, I was reading God's word. And I was reading about the rich young ruler who turned away and left at a direct invitation to follow Jesus. And I started to close my Bible. In fact, I did close it. And the Holy Spirit said, you need to keep reading just a little bit further. And I opened it back up and the very next passage underneath where it talked about the rich young ruler walking away was where Peter said, Lord, we've left all and followed you. What about us? And Jesus said these words and it resonated with him because it was some of my concerns. No man has left houses, land, wife, children for my sake that shall not receive more in this life and the life to come. And when I read that passage, it was like a light bulb. It was like a slap across my face because I was so concerned about having to move away to become a preacher. My children have to move schools, all, all kinds of thoughts. I said, there's no way. But as I yielded to the Lord and I made known to my parents and Susie's parents to begin with, and then in my church, I let it be known the very next Sunday, and I was bawling like a baby, couldn't hold it in, just let him loose and let God have his way. And from that moment on, I've tried to be obedient. You see, I've always been the kind of person that I'd do what I thought I could do, but I wouldn't go no further. I wouldn't step out in faith in what I didn't think I could do. I would only do the things I knew I could do. Not go beyond what I didn't think I could do. I'll give you for instance. Preacher had me and our drummer at the time, he was in a group, Elmer Farmer. And Mr. Herman Rich from the Winter area, he was supposed to bring the devotion that morning. And I never brought a devotion before then before. And Mr. Herman was supposed to be there. I was there to help cook. <laughs> and so Herman called and the preacher was on the phone with him. He was sick, couldn't make it. The preacher looked at Elmer and said, Elmer, would you do the devotion for us this morning? Herman can't make it. The Elmer started back here. I, 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 can't, I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't do that. <laughs> then he looked at me. <laughs> Roy, would you do the devotion for it? And I was about to do an Elmer on it. <laughs> but then the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, all right. You done said whatever anybody asked you to do for the glory of God, you would do. And so I meant to say, no, but you know what come out of my mouth? I'll do it. I said, preacher, let me go to the back and let me prepare because I'm not prepared. And y'all just finished the breakfast for us. So I went to the back and I come back. And you know what? I still remember my very first devotion. It was life assurance. About 
the blood being applied to the doorposts back through the days of Egypt and how the blood must be applied to our hearts. I still remember that. That was my very first devotion to a group of people. You think I thought I could ever do that? No, I, but I did. And from then on, I began growing because instead of saying no, every time somebody said something, I began to say yes. If it would glorify God, I began growing in the Lord, stronger than I ever had before. And I said that to say this. If you're used to saying no all the time, try saying yes and watch how the Lord will really grow you in the spirit. Amen? Because he grew me. And I'm still growing. I'm just a child of God, still growing every day. But I learned to let go and let God have his way. And I don't have to know the outcome to say yes. I step out in faith and allow God to lead. That's how you grow in the Lord, by stepping out in faith. Now notice what we see here. Once again in verse 15 it says, And four angels were loose, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. To slay the third part of men. The demonic locust we had talked about at the beginning of this study, if you remember in our last study, they went to torment men for five months. But now we are told that one third of the population of the earth is going to be slain, not tormented, but killed. So these four angels had the authority to kill on a massive scale. Now, we have already seen one-fourth of the population of the earth killed in the fourth seal. Uh, that mentions that in Revelation 6, verse 8. Now we're going to see one-third more killed of the population of the earth. That means that over one-half of the world's population by the sixth trumpet is going to be killed on the face of this earth. Now, let's do a little math on that. We'll take 100. That's a good round number. If you kill 25% of 100, then that leaves 75. Then if you kill one-third of the 75, that leaves 50. And so that's how you arrive at one half of the world by the sixth trumpet has been killed at this time because of all the devastation that's going to go on. Now look at verse 16. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand. And I heard the number of them. And so this army, when you look at the 200,000 thousand, uh, many Bible, Bible commentators believe this means 200 million. 200 million. Uh, some have said that if you were to line up a stack of men, of 200 million men, it would be one mile deep and 87 miles long. That's how many 200 million would make. As we read the description of this vast army, one of the questions arise, is this a human army made up of human beings or is it a demonic army as of the locusts that come up out of the bottomless pit? Well, it could be a demonic army since we've already seen the locusts come out and do God's bidding, afflicting and tormenting men for five months, who are led by the four angels who are bound, that God is using to bring judgment to this world. But it also could be human beings and human army that is being demonically controlled and energized. We simply don't have enough information to say dogmatically which way it is. Nobody knows the answer. I don't care what commentary you're going to find. You're going to find some very uh, wonderful people who differ on whether this is a demonic army or a human army energized by Satan. But here's what John tells us about this army. First of all, there are men who are under the banner of hell. They're doing hell's bidding if it is a human army. Uh, they are under control and direction of Satan and his demons. Look at verses 17 through 19 as we read the description. 
And thus I saw horses in the vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed, by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. And so the horse is normally an animal that is associated with war. Uh, we saw the Antichrist come riding out in chapter 6 on a white stallion, a bow but no arrows, but symbolizes he was a conqueror. We're going to see Jesus ride out in Revelation 19 on a great white stallion. And so we notice that a white horse, in particular, means the commander of an army. And so we see that this horse is an animal which symbolizes war. And then, then notice the description, breastplates of fire, fiery red in color, fire red. Then Jacob, which is a dull, dark blue, and that could be the smoke. We're talking about the fire and the smoke. And then the brimstone, a light yellow. And we've all seen fire, and talk about the brimstone. And so we've all seen fire in our times, and we've seen the red, we've seen the yellow, we've seen the blue, we see the smoke. And so it's very familiar with us. And they have the power to kill out of their mouths, is what the scripture says. And serpents were their tails. Now think about this for a moment. Red, blue, yellow, these are all the colors of fire. And these colors are associated with, with the torments of hell itself. We're speaking about the lake of fire and brimstone, the final place uh, that all of those who have rejected Christ will end up. And so these horses are breathing fire and smoke and brimstone. And this gives us images of hell and of its torments. Hell's going to be a place of smoke and fire and brimstone. The scripture teaches us this. These soldiers come out with the colors of hell the smell of hell and the weapons of hell and the energy of hell and they are controlled by hell. Now, you'll find many different Bible commentators and many preachers that try to explain what this is. But once again, this is one of those things we can't explain because it doesn't tell us. Many will say that what you're seeing here is the future of war breaking out, nuclear war the helicopters and the missiles and how we have these helicopters with missiles in the back that fire out as they try to describe that with the serpents and uh, the mouths and lions about tanks and how they shoot out and the smoke comes out and the fire comes out and so we don't know that. It sounds like a good explanation and I'm not going to say it's wrong but I can't say it's right because the Bible is not clear on what it is. It could be something controlled by humans in warfare. We probably don't know the half of what our country and other countries have until we actually get into a worldwide war. But we're going to see that in the end times, these events are controlled by God. That's the main thing, controlled by Him. Now, look at verses 20 and 21. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, and which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. If you would consider that these that are left on the earth have been tormented for five months already. And now they're the ones that made it after the one third has been killed off. And they still refuse to accept Christ. They still refuse to come to God. Death going on all around them, destruction everywhere they turn, but they still fail to fall on their knees in repentance and call out to God for forgiveness. What we are seeing here is the depraved, wicked, rebellious spirit of man 
against a holy, righteous God. You wonder why the battle of Armageddon has to take place. When Jesus comes back, we see it right here. They are so embarrassed. They're not just going to give up their power and serve Jesus because he shows up. They are still in rebellion and unrepentant and in their depravity. And so he will have to come and fight out of his mouth the sword will slay them all. The word of his mouth. Consider, if you will, the sins that are mentioned here. Demon, worship, and idolatry. Do you know that that is what Satan has always desired? To be worshipped. It started back when he was an angelic being called Lucifer. He wanted to be God. I want to be like the Most High. He wanted to worship the God was given. But God said, hey, tapped him on the shoulder and said, you're forgetting something. I'm the creator. You're the created. Satan hasn't always been. He's a created being. He was created an angelic being. He made himself the devil by rejecting God. A demon worship will be prevalent in the end times. Notice this, murders Neither repent of they of their murders against probably murdering those against Christ. Those who want to receive Christ, they'll search them out. There'll be a lot of people that will make it through the tribulation into the, tribul uh, the millennial reign, but there'll be a whole host of people like we met already under the altar. How long, O oh, oh Lord, holy and true, must we wait? And the Lord says, until your fellow brothers should suffer as you. And so there'll be many killed who turn to Christ, but then it also could be alluded to the abortions that take place in our day and time, the murders of the innocent that are taking place. Then notice what else it says. Nor of their sorceries. The word sorcery speaks of the word that we use today, pharmacy. And anytime you think of a pharmacy, what do you think of? Drugs. And we live in a drug culture today. Amen. It's prevalent everywhere we go. Even little children <coughs> in elementary school are getting hold of drugs. Man, I remember the first time I heard about drugs. I was in high school. And it was just very seldom. But the police coming out and arresting some of the high school students had drugs in their lockers. That was, that was news to me. I've never been around anything like that. But now it's trickled down to the elementary students going on today. Drugs are ruining our young people. However, I've got to add this. Drugs are ruining a lot of old people too. Amen. Amen. They're getting hooked on them. Trying to find ways to get drugs. Stealing from their family. Stealing things from their neighbors to be able to buy drugs with. We always talk about the children getting drugs on the street corner. And we need to think about the old people getting drugs out of their medicine cabinets, hoarding it up and using it. When we know that it's destructive. Now, don't get me wrong, drugs are a wonderful thing for all of us that need them. That's what they're for, to help us. But too many of us are abusing the drugs and we get hooked on them. Then notice what else he says here. Nor of their fornication. Now today, it doesn't seem to be frowned upon as it was one day. And we're talking about not just the fornication itself, but all kinds of sexual immorality. Adultery, talking about uh, homosexualism, lesbianism, uh, talking about uh, pornography, all kinds of th stuff is going on here. But let me make a comment. If it was a sin, a hundred years ago, it's still a sin today. Amen. Amen. Our world that we live in might be accepting to it to the point that now we which hold the word of God true, we're the ones who are bigots. We're the ones who are hate mongers. All because we hold to the word of God. But if it was a sin a hundred years ago, it's still a sin today. Amen. And we need to hold true to the word of God.
Notice what it says in the end. Nor of their thefts. Uh, thievery or thefts are to cheat and to steal, <laughs> to give at any cost, to take wrongfully from another person, even at times at the point of harming a person if we want something. And so we see so much is going on. We wonder, is it going to end? Oh, yeah, it's going to end one day. But how bad is it? How bad is it? What's God's word got to say about all this we've been reading about? Well, let me refer you to a couple of scriptures in closing. <coughs> 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11 to 12. And for this cause, God should send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. You see, as time moves on, People get harder in their hearts. Let me just give you a case in point. Used to be, when we held revivals years and years and years ago, the place of God was packed. Not only Christian people, but a lot of lost people would come in. In fact, let me just give you proof right now. And I don't know. I'm just going to step out of faith. How many of you here tonight were saved in a revival? Raise your hand. Look around there. Look there. All them folks saved in a revival. How many were saved in a church? You weren't a Christian, but you were saved in a church. Look at there. Look at all those hands. You see, that's proof that unsaved people come to church. That was years ago. Fast forward to our present day. You can't hardly get saved people to come to church anymore. Huh? We're trying to reach the lost and bring them in so they can hear the gospel, but we can't even get the saved folks to come in and listen to the word of God. So we're going to need to carry the word to where they are. Then hopefully they'll come in. Here's another passage of scripture and we're going to close out. Romans chapter 1. Romans 1 verses 21 through 32. Listen to it. Romans 1, 21 through 32. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their era, which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, and whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. When people know God, know what his word says, but still refuse to worship him as God, they refuse God in his ways, they hear the gospel with their ears, but it goes in one ear and out the other because it certainly doesn't go down to the heart. But they hear these things. They do not like to think of God. 
because all they want to study is sin. Now, sin is a penalty. If it wasn't, there wouldn't be no trouble. That's how it captures so many people because it is appealing to a lustful heart. When we have our minds and our thoughts on lustful things and wicked things, it becomes appealing to us. And you know, that's a terrible condition to be in. Oh, how we need to stay focused on God. It's hard enough to stay focused because we've got families, we've got work, we've got neighbors, we've got activities, and we've got all kinds of things that would take our focus off of God if we would. So we need to work overtime to try to keep our focus. That doesn't mean we should quit living. It's just like when the Bible says, look up to the eastern sky. That doesn't mean to go out and look up and stay there for the rest of your life. But in your spirit, in your mind, be looking for the coming of Jesus. When he breaks those clouds, he's going to get us out. And as a mean, look up all the time, every day. But have that spirit of expectation. He's coming. And be ready for when he does come. It's a terrible condition when God gives you up. I've had some family give me up. I've had some friends give me up. But it is something totally different when God gives you up. Amen. And that's what we find here in the scripture. I pray that we, everyone here, and you listening in through Facebook Live, along with our families, along with our friends, we serve God wholeheartedly with everything that we have, not haphazardly. You know, when I was working public work, I never tried to do anything halfway. I tried to give everything I had to be a good employee, to make my employer look good, to do what was required and then go beyond a little bit further. I had a, a my pastor, when I left to go into the ministry, I went to full-time ministry immediately. Uh, I was told you I was called on December 26, 1991. I went preaching in different churches, holding revivals, filling in for preachers. In August of 92, just eight months, I went to my first church, full-time. My preacher, he was a bivocational preacher. He told me, he said, Lord, I would give anything be able to go full time. I would love to go visiting all the time and just study God's word appropriately, but that's not what God has called me to do. And it got me to thinking how blessed God had opened the doors of my life to start out full time. And I've never forgotten that. Every one of us had been called to a ministry. I didn't know what my ministry was until I was 32 year old. Oh, yes, I was working in the church. I was active. I was busy. I was serving different capacities. But I didn't know God had planned for me to be a preacher, to be a pastor. But I believe he waited because he was preparing me. So I become a foreman on the job site and that helped me to communicate with people and how to deal with people as a foreman to employees. And it helped me to work along with other groups and other peoples. He helped me work in all types of ministries in the church so I would know how the church operates. But I was 31, 32 before I was able to call and preach and pastor. But he had a plan for me. He's got a plan for you. You may know it right now, you may not know it. But if you don't know what your plan is, or rather what God's plan is, Pray about it. Search God for it. He'll reveal it to you. I think I can pinpoint when God decided to make me a preacher. I didn't know it at the time. I was working at CPNL. I had just come out of the drywall. I was hot as I could be. I, it was summertime. I was, and you know how hot it gets in August. Well, it's twice as hot in the drywall. 
come back and dehydrated. I was by the water cooler. The old time water cooler. You got these little triangle cups. I would drink water. Here was my thought. I can still remember. Lord, what do I want to do the rest of my life? It sure ain't this. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember thinking, Lord, I love your work so good. It'd be wonderful if you just let me do your work. I think that's the moment he decided to open the door for me. It didn't happen right then. It was a while longer. I think he heard that prayer and he worked on that prayer. And so I don't know what your plan is. I bet God does. Why don't you ask God about it? What do you say? God, what's your plan for me? Just open my heart and mind to receive it, whatever it is. He'll do it. Any questions, any comments? Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful Lord, for this night you've given us. We pray your blessings upon each and every one that's here that's listening. For those through Facebook Live, we appreciate the attendance and the attention of those as well. We give you the glory and the praise as we continue in our study of Revelation. Uh, horrific scenes we have seen tonight. And Father, we're going to see a parenthesis in chapter 10. We ask your blessings as we continue studying. Give us the knowledge that we need to be able to share it with other people. To share their ways. If they have any questions, any thoughts about you, that you would give us the answers to be able to give to them. Give us the wisdom and the courage to speak on your behalf. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.